Fáilte and welcome to episode number three of Ancient Landscapes with myself, Tara Tyne. In this six-part series, I will be selecting some of my favourite landscapes in Ireland's ancient east and taking a journey back through the ages to uncover some of their hidden mysteries. We'll explore the ruins of some of our most famous landmarks and the myths and legends which reside there, with interviews from experts and amateur enthusiasts alike to guide us along the way. In this episode, entitled Inneskeen and its Ancient Arts, we'll travel west of Dundalk and over the border into Monaghan, to the last stronghold of the ancient kingdom of Oriel. We'll be honing in on the southeast of the county at the end of the Monaghan stretch of the near impassable border of Drumlands, commonly referred to as the Black Pig's Dyke. Here, the village of Inneskeen seems to have been a stop along the way for travellers heading north or south, at least back as far as the medieval period, when it briefly played host to the fearsome forces of Edward de Bruce, who had arrived from R.D. The place managed to narrowly avoid becoming a battleground between himself and the Earl of Ulster, who was backed by the might of an English army and approaching from the south to confront him, when Edward turned tail and headed north for Coleraine instead. But we'll save de Bruce's shenanigans for the next episode, Far more relevant to the subject at hand is the rich collection of lesser explored prehistoric and early Christian art forms which have inhabited the landscape around Inneskeen since time immemorial, along with the people who enjoyed them. Of course, when we hear the name of Inneskeen, we often think first of the poet Patrick Kavanagh, who, at the end of the 1930s, left Inneskeen to move to Dublin, But the Monaghan he left behind was still heaving with stories and storytellers, many of which drew inspiration from a particular ancient site, known as Manan's Castle in Dunamoyne. Major General F. W. Stubbs theorised in a 1910 volume of the County Louth Archaeological Journal that Manan's Castle may have been an early seat of power for the ancient kingdom of Oriel after its establishment, just before the coming of Christianity to Ireland in the 5th century. The restored castle still sits on top of an impressive and domineering moat, and today it towers over a golf club, and although we know it was built in the 13th century by a family named Pippard, and was named for Manan in the Annals of Ulster in 1244, it's harder to figure out who its namesake, Manan, actually was. One story from the 1930s school's collection says he was a druid who turned himself into a dove and flew away in order to avoid getting stuck chatting with St. Patrick. Another says he was a king who knew magic and that after he died, there was a cow and calf at his castle who would give milk to anyone wanting it. Yet another account suggests he was a pagan chief who kept his hoard of gold at the bottom of the largest of the three small lakes in the castle grounds and that he denied St. Patrick entry to the castle three times when the saint came calling. St. Patrick then punished Manan by turning him into an eel of no mean proportion and throwing him into the lake where he could guard his gold forevermore. A more sinister take on this tale says that Manan had actually planned to poison St. Patrick at his castle, but someone gave Patrick the heads up and Patrick refused the poisoned meat. Manan made one more failed attempt at killing Patrick, and so Patrick turned him into a salmon, put him in a bottle, and drowned him. And after all the stories are told about Manan, and none of them agree with each other on any major point, we're still left wondering about the mysterious Manan who may or may not be heard to cry near his castle just once in every seven years. It was apparently the eerie presence of the domineering Norman structure at the time a mere ruin, the thick plantation of trees enclosing the place from sunlight and the three perilously small and deep lakes within the grounds that made Manan's castle the subject of many tall and often bone-chilling tales, featuring no less than the almighty St. Patrick himself. But it is not the only site in this part of Monaghan to have associations with one of Ireland's patron saints. In the village of Inneskeen can today be seen the picturesque ruin of a round tower, nestled beside a small 19th century Protestant church, around which the river fane sweeps lazily beneath a stone bridge. It's around here that a monastery was founded by St. Daig and was said to have been blessed by St. Columba in the 6th century. 
Saint Dig, originally from Meath with the surname Carol, was noted for his exceptional skill in various art forms. He was said to have gotten his name from a near-death experience as a child when he survived a fire untouched at the house of St. Magda at Loud Village and was declared by Magda to be inflamed with the Holy Spirit and so was named Dig, meaning Great Flame. Dig was thereafter said to have been able to perform great miracles and was also trained in the material pursuits of metallurgy and scribing with which he is said to have produced 150 bells, 100 strong-ringed croziers, and 60 perfect gospels, for which he made 60 elegant metal covers. In another version of the story, the number of items was said to have been as great as 300 each. Some of Daig's work was plain and made of iron, but much of it was highly wrought with gold, silver, and precious ornaments. He is also said to have produced a large number of other various ecclesiastical items necessary for the celebration of early Christian Mass, such as chalices, crucifixes, and dishes and containers fit to hold the sacred bread, wine, and chrism oil. He is said to have received his early education in letter writing, literature, and metalwork at the small island monastery of Devonish on Loch Erin where he had been brought as a boy by his uncle, who was an abbot there. After a later spell of study in Bangor, Dig graduated and went to work as a smith for St. Kieran of Clonmacnoise, where he is thought to have produced the main bulk of his work. At some point, Dig was directed by the holy abbot of Clonmacnoise to fulfil another prediction which had been made about his future by St. Magda at Loud Village, which stated, Between me and the mountain northwards, he shall found a beautiful monastery. This he did at Inneskeen, which at the time had only a parish church in the area. He is said to have lived there until his death in the late 6th century. And if you stand on the northern bank of the River Fane, looking over the bridge on a sunny day, you can easily imagine what an agreeable place this would have been to found a monastery in which to live out the rest of your days. More tantalising yet, though, is the question of whether Dig was aware of the breathtaking selection of prehistoric rock art situated all around his chosen home at the time that he chose it? Or perhaps did he find out later? Surely a famously talented artisan like himself, if ever he made a trip into Old Dundalk, would have been told to stop in at the elaborately carved panel of ancient rock art at Carrick Robin that looked, at least to one loud antiquarian, like the crude figure of a goddess or the equally enigmatic cup and ring patterns which appear in the nearby townlands of Drumsinnet, Drumca, Anna, Tullagy, Ballinlochan, Tankard's Rock, Cortial. Actually, there's at least one panel in pretty much every townland along the six-mile distance between Inneskeen and Dundalk. And who knows, maybe he was a real fan and even knew about the long-forgotten interlocking spiral hidden in outcropping bedrock at Lisna Willie, not far from where Cúhollan's castle is now. And if by some chance he never made it to Dundalk, or perhaps he never happened upon one of these ancient and mysterious specimens on his way, it's harder again to imagine that he managed to live what we're told was a reasonably long life in Inneskeen without once ever stumbling upon the jewel in the crown of ancient rock art in this part of the country, which is located a mere mile and a half to the southeast of the Fane Bridge in the area known as Dromural. This breathtaking complex at Dromural comprises over 70 panels of probably Bronze Age but perhaps even Stone Age rock art and is enclosed to the east and north by the River Fane, which marks the local boundary between Louth and Meath. Its most striking known feature is the panel which has seven perfect concentric circles carved expertly into the stone face, giving the effect of perfectly even ripples in the surface of a lake emanating from a small cup-shaped groove where the pebble might have hit the water. The image measures approximately 50 centimetres in diameter. The boulder upon which it appears is one of several which are embedded into a high rocky outcrop which has been described as looking like a basket of eggs. If eggs were carved with impressive and ancient circular markings, of course. Many of the other panels outside of this basket of eggs are widely dispersed around an area of over 70 acres, 
and are difficult for the untrained eye to discern, or are hidden beneath lichen, grass or gorse, protected from the elements and worn down by years of erosion. Also nestled into this steeply undulating and rather secretive landscape, amongst a patchy blanket of gorse bushes, are dozens more crude circular carvings whose meaning has been lost to time. Even more tantalising is the matching panel of rock art on the far side of Inneskeen village, on the opposite bank of the Fane at Miskish Moor, which mirrors the seven concentric circles of the impressive panel at Dromirrell. The frustrating thing about rock art is that we don't know an awful lot about it. We're not even sure how old it is. Many attempts have been made to guess at the meanings behind the circular patterns and other motifs that are common to the style referred to as Atlantic rock art. But with no conclusive answers in any direction, did the artists mean to create something lasting, something important to the sacred rituals and ceremonies of their communities, like St. Aig did, or were they simply fulfilling a more mundane purpose, as sometimes suggested, like marking routeways or natural features such as river fords, entrances to valleys, or areas that were in some way useful to know about? One particularly compelling theory suggests that the trail of rock art between Dromirrell and Dundalk may have been marking the way to the huge, unnamed complex of sacred monuments, which we'll be discussing in the next episode. Dromirrell is the only rock art site in Ireland to have been excavated at time of writing, and the results of the geophysical surveys carried out by the late Dr Blaise O'Connor and her team in 2006 did not disappoint. A fire pit was found near the centre of the complex, from in and around which were gathered 39 shards of Stone Age pottery, suggesting there's been human habitation in the area for up to 5,000 years. Standing amongst the disorientating collection of pillar-like outcrops of stone, it is not hard to imagine how the images would have looked when illuminated by the flickering glow of a nearby fire, their raised relief effect patterns dancing and pulsing with every small passing breeze. Evidence of other early human activity, such as flint scrapers and an enigmatic blue glass bead, were found in the excavated trenches at Dromirrell, adding more clues to an as-yet unsolved puzzle. As one Professor Tilly wrote in his book about landscapes, if people could say it, they would not make it. But just what were these ancient peoples trying to say to each other, or perhaps to future generations, or both? At this point, I decided to have a chat with Dr. Connor Brady, lecturer in archaeology at Dundalk Institute of Technology and member of the Council of the County Louth Archaeological and Historical Society. With his particular interest in landscape archaeology, I was keen to hear his thoughts on this most fascinating of sites. The symbols that we get in the Atlantic style of rock art, there a lot of them are quite kind of abstract. Um, they're very simple and um, they're cup and ring marks and um, they're, they're kind of um, uh, penanular circles, uh, radial lines, things like that. So they're, they're, they're very sort of graphic, they're, they're, they're very abstract. These symbols, generally speaking, are carved into um, natural outcrops of rock. Um, they're, they're not on quarried boulders, they're not parts of big monuments, they, they occur in the, the natural landscape, if you like. And they're not, um, uh, um, you know, so it, it is um, difficult sometimes to um, discover them. Uh, they're, they're not on anything that's, that's clearly uh, monumental. Um, so pe- many of these are, are discovered kind of by accident. Um, but the symbols are very, very simple. As I said, the cup marks seem to be a focus. Um, many of these cup marks um, seem to be natural to start out with. Mm. And it's as if people living in the landscapes where these rock outcrops occur see these marks in the rock. Now, many of them can look, even though they're natural, they can look very, very regular um, as if they were deliberately put there. So people, you know, living in these landscapes, they would have known their own places like the back of their hands. Um, They could well have observed these and wondered where they came from. 
and they may well have had folk beliefs associated with how they were created, how they were got, how they how they were put there. Um, the research suggests that they're they're, they're not um, humanly uh, uh, created, but they embellish them. They actually use them as the uh, the focus or the starting point for whole panels sometimes of uh, quite intricate abstract um, symbolism. As I said, you know you um, you have. Um, circles surrounding them and um, concentric circles uh, circles with tails out of them um, and and various other very simple sort of geometric forms as well but it seems like these are the um, the trigger for it and um, they may well have thought gods goddesses spirits or whatever who inhabited the landscape before put those marks on the rocks and they're recognizing this and they're wanting to take ownership and uh, and embellish and add them and, and and incorporate them into their their own belief systems I was curious what the meaning or function of these carved panels may have been, so I asked Connor about the kinds of theories that have been put forward by experts in the field of Atlantic rock art. Some people have suggested that they may have functioned as kind of territorial markers, that these symbols were placed on rocks along the edge of uh, the land that a, a, a tribe or a, or, or a group would have lived in and farmed in, just as a, a kind of a keep out sign, if you like. Um, n- n- that that is very very simplistic. They may well have had um, th- th- that may have been part of the the reason why they were put there. But I think there are probably deeper, more spiritual um, reasons for it as well. Other suggest that they may have marked routeways through the um, landscapes also. Um, and you know that that is possible. People may well have uh, have, have travelled on along certain lines, but we don't have very clear evidence of any of the the routes that uh, would have existed during prehistoric times. Um, there are uh, myths and legends and traditions relating to routeways le- leading to the Hill of Tara, for example, um, but they are from much later times. Um, this rock art you're talking about, you know, 2500, 2300 BC, and um, we don't have clear evidence of, uh, of of roots going back that far. Now, so you know, they they, they may well have uh, have have marked routeways. Some of them do seem to have a broadly kind of a linear pattern through the landscapes where they occur. Mm. Um, so it's it's possible and um, can't be completely discounted. But as I said, you know, I, I think there's something deeper going on. I think these were put on places that uh, became special. Um, you know, Richard Bradley, Professor Richard Bradley wrote one, one of his books some years ago about the archaeology of natural places. Um, in Ireland, you know, we, we think about prehistory, we think about people making special places. We think about tombs and monuments all of the time and, and big things that stick up. That's what we do in the 21st century. That's what we identify with. But an awful lot of archaeology happened in and around um, uh, uh, natural places, um, you know, on hilltops, um, rock outcrops, uh, places with nice views. And you don't necessarily get very intense construction work going on at them where where you're left with something very, very visible in the landscape. And I think this is uh, uh, the the rock art kind of marks some of the uh, the places that were um, special to these people for whatever reasons. It's possible that over generations, people came and went from these um, sites and they may have added their own over time. People are, are, are quite motivated to put their mark um, on these places, possibly building them up over time. Um, um, so certainly, I think that the, the routeway idea could well be, be, be important. Um, there, there may well have been a ceremonial routeway linking all of these monuments. I know there's late Neolithic uh, um, monuments that have been identified um, on the the M1 um, the Western Bypass. Yeah, really thought. exciting stuff over um, there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So there, there is a focus of uh, kind of ceremonial ritual activity in that area. Um, it, you know, it's a very lived in landscape at that time, back in, in, in prehistoric times, late Stone Age, early Bronze Age times. Um, and there does seem to be quite a, a focus of activity. Um, there is a, a passage tomb as well at, at Killen Hill. Um, and there was um, passage tomb art associated with that. And some of it has uh, since disappeared. That was uh, recorded as, as, as far back as the um, the 18th century by Thomas Wright in his um, his, his book, Laudiana. Um, so there's a tradition, a strong tradition there, and people may well at particular times of year have, pr- have processed through that landscape, um, visiting various sites, maybe adding art to it. Um, th- there's burials in and around there as well. There's megalithic 
tombs mm. not quite down that that um, that, that that far uh, but there are also early Bronze Age pit and cyst burials. There's a number of um, uh, of sites uh, uh, north of uh, of Dundalk in more or less the same landscape. So, the, so there is a lot going on, and people would, on a routine basis, I think, on an occasional basis at least, have been travelling uh, between these sites, uh, remembering the people have gone before. Uh, uh, revisiting the special places in their landscape. So, you know, it is all possible. Uh, we, we we don't have the answers, you know, and we, 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 uh, we have ideas, uh, but we'll never get the uh, uh, to the root of it, I think. So since it's not currently possible to definitively say what the purpose of the carved petroglyphs at Romerol was, I was interested to hear more about some of the other excavational finds that were made on site there as a result of Blaise O'Connor's pioneering research. I, I, I think that there certainly was an enclosure identified around the kind of one of the, the low knolls, one of the, 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 the rock outcrops. We see them an awful lot. Some of them have very mundane, uh, um, uh, practical uh, um, reasons for, for existence, that they are like animal enclosures. But this one, I think, kind of separated out one of the rock outcrops from the surrounding landscape. It's almost as if it was maybe keeping the animals out. Um, very often, special places are defined by the um, creation of enclosures around them. The enclosure is, is only one element there. There's a whole range of um, pits and post holes as well. So, um, the, you know, Lord knows what uh, what sort of features actually, actually existed there at various times. And um, there's a lot going on at that site, certainly. Um, but it is interesting that they did choose at that particular point to uh, to to enclose the site. That there is a slight kind of monumentalization of that particular feature going on. So so Blaze anyway um, decided to to take it a step further than 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 just kind of observing what sites were close by, and she carried out geophysics in and around um, um, a number of the sites and identified a series of uh, possible features. And then she followed up with um, um, with an excavation um, and she found a whole range of small scale features um, uh, pits and deposits and, and so on. Some of them dating back as far as the early Neolithic, almost as, as early as 4000 BC, um, close to some of these, uh, the, the, these rock art sites. So there is the possibility that some of the rock art may well date back as far as the early Neolithic. Now, we, we can't say that for absolutely um, for certain. Um, it may well be that um, this kind of ceremonial activity started in certain places and the nature of the, of the activity developed and changed over time. Um, the rock art may be added later. It may have been there right from the beginning. But it underlines the fact that these places that were chosen for the rock art, they are special. Um, and they're they're maintained as being special places over generations. Uh, people come back again and again and again. The memory is kept alive um, and they actively engage with them and they, 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 they add to them um, and generation after generation. So a very, very powerful tradition, um, if you like. Um, and of course, at some stage, it's forgotten about. Um, and it's again, people like yourself going back, you're reviving old ideas again, which is uh, which is fantastic. Um, we shouldn't forget about these things. Um, and it's great fun trying to see into the minds of these people um, who lived so long ago. And um, they're not all that different to us. They're, they're living in the same landscapes as we do now. So as we leave one ancient landscape behind in southeast County Monaghan, and follow the clear trail of panel after panel of prehistoric rock art, which dots the way back to Dundalk. Be sure to tune into the next episode when we visit the monument-filled landscape between the foothills of the Hill of Fahert and the ancient town of Dundalka. Along the way, we'll meet two of the more famous figures to have associations with this area, Bridget of Fahert and Edward de Bruce, and look a bit closer at how they may have interacted with the landscape here. We'll also be speaking to Niall Roycroft and Shane Delaney, archaeologists with the National Roads Authority, who were involved in the excavation project in this area as part of the M1 Dundalk Western Bypass project in the early 2000s. Thanks to David Bellew on sound and to Dundalk FM for their support in making this programme. I've been your host, Tara Tyne, and these are our ancient landscapes. (laughs) 